We tell you now about members of parliament. They voted in favor of the amendment of the hate crimes and hate speech bill. The bill, which was first adopted in March, will now be sent for adjustments. Political parties, including the DA, the Freedom Front Plus, and the ACDP, are opposing the bill as they believe it limits freedom of speech. Tony Eindruch is the COSATU Deputy Parliamentary Coordinator, and he joins us now for more on this. Tony, you were always in favor of this bill being hurried up and being passed. Just remind our viewers your position and why absolutely good afternoon to the viewers and to yourself for us it's an absolutely essential bill we've seen the most horrendous examples in our society of hate crimes of racial discriminatory actions of conduct that's clearly meant to divide our communities and not bring them closer together and so the Constitution enjoins Parliament to make sure that it puts in place the requisite legislation to make sure that communities are protected. We feel that this bill goes far enough to address that, while at the same time ensuring that freedom of expression is not curtailed in certain key and defined areas. So if it goes to academic needs or any uh, cultural or other activities, then there are exemptions and there are special considerations. The parties that are opposed to it clearly are those who may have been beneficiaries of apartheid and clearly harker back to those days where they can act and treat people as they chose and even be as bold as putting it in the legal framework. It's just sad that even now, 30 years nearly into our democracy, the parties don't come around to ensuring that in South Africa we do everything we can to avoid the kind of incidences we've seen in Rwanda and elsewhere where this kind of hate crimes and hate speech has been allowed to perpetrate. So we want the president to sign it as soon as possible so that it can bring the required defense to our people. Mm. You speak of um, not being against it if it's for academic and cultural needs or not being opposed to it. But you take a look at what happened um, early this year, I think, with the Nelson Mandela Foundation and um, the group Afri Forum when it comes to the use of the apartheid flag. They argued at the time that it was for academic purposes. And so what do you do with such instances practically? Yeah, I think that the courts would have to, as is contained in the law, uh, would have to educate the society so that it has clear publications and uh, conscientizing programs to make sure that people understand exactly how the legislation should be dealt with, what are the responsibilities that we have as citizens, and how we can ensure that people don't make themselves guilty of that. It's not surprising that Afri Forum would use the legislation and use our courts to defend their uh, privileged position under apartheid and to really add insult to injury by flying a flag that for such a long time had represented the oppression of our people and the exploitation of our people that had placed them in poverty and horrendous circumstances. Uh, it's a sad day that there are still people in this country that try and defend those clear signs of what can only be seen as neo-Nazi type behavior and conduct and neo-Nazi symbols. We believe that there must be clear examples where things may serve to divide our people further and we must all get behind what we've agreed to represents our societal culture and our societal norms of expression. Uh, Continuing to wave apartheid flags in our faces does not contribute to enhancing our dignity or making sure that those who had acted with hate when they flew that flag in front of us are not doing the same in the democratic dispensation. You speak of the courts intervening and helping people to understand better. And you speak of um, societal culture and societal norms. What represents societal culture? I guess that question pops up again. Is South Africa a country or is South Africa a nation? What is the difference? Well, we uh, we certainly a nation in being. But part of our speed to arriving at the nation that's really a reflection of all of our people and the rainbow that we've spoken about before. To get there, we must make sure that we don't undermine the dignity of any persons within our communities, that we respect all of them, and that we don't make ourselves guilty of hate crimes. And so, we think that the law does obligate the legislative arm, as well as the director of prosecutions, 
to ensure that there's clear training, not only for the officials in the courts and the policemen who must investigate these crimes, but also that they work in conjunction with the other institutions, the Human Rights Commission and all other institutions that's meant to defend the dignity of our people, but that that collaboration is institutionalized and that the way we give expression to that contributes to creating this nation that we all want to see in our country. And so, given the horrendous examples that we've seen in the past of hate speech, we've got to make sure that the law, now that we have the experiences of how people conduct themselves, and now that we're also aware of how many people still harker back to the old days of oppression and exploitation, that we've got to be clear about what the law does, and where there are not people who want to come into compliance with our ambitions of becoming one nation, where those people continue to live amongst us and continue to undermine our agenda of building one nation, those people must be subjected to the harshest power of the law, and this law that's now, this act that's now been passed, will ensure that we're able to have clarity on what must be done, and that nobody can, can pretend that they were not aware of what the implications would be of conduct that constitutes hate speech or hate crimes. Tony, just out of curiosity, when last were you um, exposed to hate speech or hate crimes or someone close to you or read a story or saw a story when last? Well, not personally for the longest time, other than the cold shoulder that you get from certain groupings when you arrive at certain functions or institutions, but that's just their personal expression and that doesn't constitute hateful conduct. But I am aware of many instances, especially on farms, where the power relations remain so skewed in favor of the bosses and people's dignity is undermined on a daily basis, not only on the conditions that they live in, but also in the way that they're treated by farm, farm owners. And so in many instances, we get reports from farm workers about how the farmers continue to use derogatory terms against them, continues to treat them in a way that undermines their dignity and generally still behaves like South Africans before 1994. This law, we hope, must be vociferously implemented to make sure that those criminals and thugs who want to perpetuate apartheid that walk amongst us, that they know what the implications are and that they know that there will be no getting away now. We want to encourage people to use the law to defend our dignity because the more we are unable to ensure that the recalcitrant ones who benefited under apartheid doesn't come into the, into the call and become part of our nation. And thank goodness most white communities, most of all of our communities want to comply and want to see that we build a nation and don't make themselves guilty of that. It's those outliers who continue to wish back to the days of apartheid, who continues to disturb our, our country and disturb our process of nation building. But thank goodness that the law says, both as it affects individuals who are directly confronted by such an incident, but also those family members or communities or areas where they come from who may also be impinged by that kind of behavior would have the opportunities to be able to take action against that in the future. So we think it's a great law. We are a bit concerned that it took so long to get here, but we're glad that it's been speeded up now as a direct consequence of the really can only be described as hateful behavior still demonstrated, unfortunately, by some who reside in South Africa and who benefited from apartheid and who want to wish back to those days. My understanding of the law is very limited in the various spheres that support it, but as I understand it, um, it, they, they're already burdened, right, with even petty crimes um, in South Africa. And so as we fetch 30 years as a democratic nation in South Africa, how do you legislate personal conversations that are had um, behind closed doors that play themselves out in public so naturally? Unfortunately, I cannot get your response because I am being pressed for time. So I do hope that we will get you back on, Tony, and we can answer some of those questions. Tony Heinrich, Kosatu Deputy Parliamentary Coordinator, thank you.